questions. Everybody seems to have a question that they need answered in life. Hi, my name is Eric. In this next seminar, Dr. Hoven takes a large variety of questions that he's been asked on a regular basis and combines them and gives his best explanation for what's happening. He covers a variety of topics such as the Red Sea Crossing, primitive man, what about radiocarbon dating? Hey, are there really contradictions in the Bible? Find out for yourself in this seminar entitled, Questions and Answers. Welcome to our very informal question and answer session where we deal with questions that are not covered in our seminar on creation evolution. Uh, for those just getting this material, my name is Kent Hovind. I taught high school science for 15 years and now do seminars on creation and evolution since early 1989. I've been doing this. The Bible tells us in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 7, he said, I applied my heart to know and to seek and to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things. 1 Peter chapter 3 tells us that we should be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh us a reason of the hope that's in us. I think it's good for Christians to study the truth so that they can give an answer to those that are not Christians. And it's good for those of you that are not Christians to study the truth so that you can become Christians. When you get to the top of the mountain of truth, you'll find the Christians were sitting there all along. Uh, God's word is truth. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, the Bible tells us we should study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So, in this session, we're going to deal with quite a few miscellaneous questions. If you have questions that are not covered here or elsewhere in the seminar, feel free to send them in. We'll try to deal with them as time permits on our website, drdino.com, or on our radio program, or possibly in a future edition of our question-answer tapes. One question I often get when I say I believe in creation, they're going to say, oh, wait a minute, all scientists believe in evolution. Well, that's simply not true, okay? The vast majority of scientists may believe, or some the majority of scientists may believe in evolution, but it depends on what you mean by evolution. But all scientists do not believe in evolution. And even if they did, that's not how you determine truth. It is possible for the majority to be wrong. History shows us there are many times when the majority is wrong. The majority of scientists used to teach that all the planets go around the Earth. That is wrong, as far as we know. By the way, there's still some folks who believe in the geocentric theory. I don't fight them. I disagree with them. But... Uh, there are really some surprising number of folks who believe in the geocentric theory. But for years, many people thought, the majority of people taught, that the heavy objects fall faster than lighter objects. That was taught for 2,000 years, and it's wrong. It's not true. For many years, it was taught if you're sick, you have bad blood. Take out your blood, and you'll get better. That is simply wrong. It's not true. There were places all over the country to get your blood taken out. They had little white poles out front with a red stripe around it. The barber was the blood letter. So... Even if a majority of scientists do believe something, that doesn't make it true. Let me give you an example here from the book of John, chapter 7. The people, therefore, were, they were arguing about Christ, and they said, when they heard this saying, said, of a truth, this is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David, out of the town of Bethlehem, where David was? Here's the Hovind translation. They're arguing about the wrong subject. They were arguing, should Christ come out of Bethlehem or Galilee? And they thought Jesus came from Galilee, so he can't be the Christ. They didn't realize he came from Bethlehem. So he, he was the Christ, obviously. He did come from Bethlehem, but he was raised in Galilee. In John chapter 7, it says, There was a division among the people because of him, and some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hold on him. What I get from this verse is, if you don't like somebody, if you don't like their message, kill the messenger. And this you see a lot in the creation evolution uh, arguments. If you watch some of my debates, I've had over 80 debates now at universities. Oftentimes they get so angry at me because of what I'm saying. Uh, I'm just delivering a message. I'm just telling you what the truth is from science and what God's Word says. Don't get angry at me. There are folks, there are over 500 anti hovend websites. They really don't like me. And they all want to get me into an email debate. And then they say, I won't debate them. Well, I won't get an email debate them, but I'll debate them publicly anytime, anywhere. Uh, I don't have time for an email debate. I type 12 words a minute with 19 mistakes. I simply don't have time, okay? And we have run a real busy ship around here. The next verse says, Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto him, Why have you not brought him? Now get the picture here. The Pharisees sent, their off, sent the officers off to, catch, to get Jesus, and then they came back without him, and they said, Why didn't you get him? 
And the officers said, Never man spake like this man. Here's the Hovind translation. The professors sent their students off to ask the heretic questions, but they didn't, the professors didn't go themselves. I get this a lot. I'll speak at universities. The professor doesn't show up uh, to, answer, to ask questions, but he sends his students with a list of questions. And you'll see the student pull out a list of questions, and they're going to trip up Hovind on something, you know. So they ask me their questions, and I answer all of them. And then they go back and tell their professor, well, he answered all my questions. And the professor says, well, you should have asked him this and this and this. Well, you coward, you should have come yourself, professor. Don't send your students off to do your dirty work. If you've got a question, give me a call. What I also get from this verse is the Pharisees decided they're going to use the law. They're going to legally try to stop this guy from sharing this message. They wanted to shut Jesus up. And there are people who will use legal tactics to try to shut up the Christians. They try to exclude Christianity from public schools. They can't handle the message, so they shut down the message so people don't get a chance to hear it. And that's what I see in John chapter uh, 7. Then answered them, the Pharisees, are ye also deceived? The Pharisees are saying, are you stupid? Then they said, have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed on him? Notice this, their evidence that Jesus could not be the Messiah was because they didn't believe he was the Messiah. Therefore, he can't be because we don't believe he is. You get the same kind of logic with some of these professors in colleges. They'll say, well, all scientists believe in evolution, therefore it must be true. <laughs> That's ridiculous, okay? They don't all believe in it, and even if they did, that doesn't make it true. You can see the same parallel 2,000 years ago in the book of John. Then the Pharisees said, this people who know not the law are cursed. Here's the Hovind translation of this verse. We have knowledge, you don't. We don't approve of your degree. You're ignorant if you don't believe in evolution. And you'll see this a lot in the creation evolution argument. They'll say, we're smart, everybody else is dumb. I get this a lot when I do debates. They'll say, well, the average person in the audience probably doesn't understand the complexity of this topic. And I'll say, folks, what he's trying to tell you is, you're dumb, he's smart. And that's precisely what they're trying to, trying to say in a subtle way. The next verse, verse 50 says, Nicodemus saith unto them, he that came to Jesus by night, Doth our law judge any man before it hear him, and know what he doeth? They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. And every man went to his own house. Even some of the non-believers were smart enough to realize this guy's telling the truth. And we get people by the thousands that write our ministry or call us and say, Look, I was not a believer, but I saw your material on creation, and I'm convinced creation is true. And that's what we're trying to do. We want to convince you that God's word is true. The whole argument here in John 7 started with a false assumption that Jesus came out of Galilee. Okay, they're arguing about the wrong topic. The Pharisees didn't believe in him, so they said that's proof he can't be the Christ because we don't believe him. If he was, we would believe in him. That's silly. That's the same thing you used to get today. Skeptics will say, well, has Hovind or any of these, have any of these creationists published in science journals? And when they say no, they'll say, see, that proves, that proves he can't be right. <laughs> that's their logic, okay? It doesn't take a few seconds to think how dumb that is. First place, creationist material is routinely excluded from creation from science journals, because from I should say science journals, because they've started with a definition that science cannot include the supernatural. Therefore, if your explanation isn't 100 percent natural, it's not science. Therefore, creation is by definition not science. That's their thinking. They don't realize evolution is not science. Evolution is based purely on the assumption that things happen. It's never observed or tested or demonstrated in the laboratory. It's purely religious. The majority can often be wrong. The majority followed Aaron in rebellion in Exodus chapter 32. The majority voted not to go into the promised land in Numbers chapter 32. The majority followed false gods many times throughout the Old Testament. Read through it and you'll see the majority was wrong. The majority of religious leaders hated Jesus. The majority of the world hates Christians. So it is not true that all Christians, all scientists believe in evolution. If it were, that wouldn't matter. Okay. And you don't determine truth that way. But let me share with you a few Christians who are scientists, who are strong believers in creation, and who are also very brilliant scientists. Robert Gentry, a friend of mine from uh, Tennessee, is a brilliant scientist when it comes to radioactive material and the disposal of radioactive waste. He worked at Oak Ridge Laboratories. He published this book here, Creation's Tiny Mysteries. Excellent book about radiopolonium halos. You can get it through our ministry in our bookstore or on our website. Robert Gentry was doing tremendous work. It was published in many major science journals about radio polonium halos being found in granites all over the world. I went and met with Robert Gentry, saw, his, saw the polonium halo through the microscope in his laboratory, and everybody was fine until they realized, wow, his research proves the Big Bang Theory is not true. And boy, they shut off his funding and his grant money in a hurry. He uh, finally uh, said, well, we don't, we don't have a job for you anymore. 
just because his research was supporting creation. Dr. Robert Gentry up in uh, Halo, at, go to www.halos.com and see for yourself. Dr. Uh, uh, sorry, Roger DeHart was a science teacher in, uh, near Seattle, Washington. He was told he could not inform his students of errors in the textbooks. Here they've got textbooks with mistakes in them, but he couldn't tell the students about the mistakes because it, they, those mistakes were used to support the evolution theory. He said, they said you can't even pass out current science journals to inform students of mistakes in the textbooks. That's not science. That's that, uh, you know, burn the heretic attitude that some people get, or go burn the witch, you know. And there's, talk about a witch hunt. The evolutionists are on a witch hunt against the creationists in the public schools. They will try desperately to get them fired from their job. Kevin Haley was a biology teacher at Central Oregon Community College in Bend, Oregon. He lost his job simply because he was exposing errors in the textbooks. He'd say, kids, the information on page 87 has been proven wrong. Disregard that. That won't be on the test. And he's right. It was proven wrong. I debated one professor one time, and I gave out like 20 or 30 lies in the textbooks. And he got up and said, now, folks, Hoven's right. All these things are not true. But he said, Hoven, I got a question. What are you going to replace all this with? <laughs> in other words, we can't take the lies out of the books until I find a replacement. In other words, I've got to provide evidence for his theory, or else we can't take the lies out of the books. Talk about dumb. Uh, that's not the way science works, okay? You teach the kids the truth. Just teach the truth, okay? And if all you have are lies to back up your theory, then get a new theory. In uh, Texas, Baylor University fired William Dembski just because he advocated that there might be an intelligent designer. Oh, that's heresy. There could be a designer. You're out of here. You're fired. Forrest Mims was a science writer for 20 years. He published in National Geographic, Science Digest, American Journal of Physics, over 60 magazines and newspapers. He was denied a job as science writer for Scientific American simply because he was a creationist. They didn't want to have a creationist on their staff. Teacher Rod Levesque was told he could not uh, share information that might help students doubt Darwin's theory. See, Darwin's theory is sacred. You don't question it without losing your job in many school systems. Okay? The same thing happened in Russia 10, 15 years ago. If a teacher got up in their class and said, kids, I don't believe communism works, <laughs> he'd be out of a job and maybe out of the country or out of this life, they'd kill him or send him off to Siberia. You get the same kind of academic Siberia, people sent off to academic Siberia if they don't support the evolution theory right here in America, the land of the fee and the home of the slave. Mr. Uh, Eller told his teacher Dan Clark in Lafayette, Indiana, Mr. Eller was the uh, superintendent, that he could not introduce creationism to his class. So uh, Dan Clark resigned, he quit. Many good teachers are dropping out of the public school system because they're not allowed to teach kids the truth. The problem is not the law. The law says you can teach creation. Not a problem to teach creation legally. The courts have ruled it's okay to teach creation, but the boss says don't do it. The ACLU, which is the American Communist Lawyers Union, they learned years ago all they have to do is threaten to sue and the school will back down. Even though the ACLU knows they will lose the suit, doesn't matter, the threat of a suit is enough to make it the, teacher, the teachers get fired. Just the threat of a suit. And so that's what's happening. We're losing by default. They're not even putting up a good fight. Dean Kenyon was a professor at uh, San Francisco State University in San Francisco. He wrote uh, many books about evolution. He was the poster boy for the evolutionist. He was a strong believer in the theory. And one day he got converted and began to believe in creation. And they fired him. He sued. They put him back in as a lab assistant, you know, washing test tubes, which the students do normally. And here's a guy, 20-year, I believe, tenured professor, Finally, after a long battle, he was reinstated with his job. But if he hadn't been tenured, he wouldn't have kept his job. That's what happened to Dean Kenyon. He wrote the book Of Pandas and People, which you can get through our ministry. Uh, Dr. Denny at uh, Texas Tech University had on his website for years that if you wanted to get recommended for medical school, he's from Lubbock, Texas, that you had to confess to believing in evolution. If you don't believe in evolution, you, he's not going to recommend you for medical school. When I spoke in Lubbock, Texas in the fall of 2002, the students there got together and offered Denny $900 if he would debate me. He refused. He wouldn't debate for two hours for 900 bucks. I don't know how much he makes an hour, but I suspect it's not quite that much. So, Mr. Denny, I'll come anytime, anywhere, and take you on intellectually in a debate on creation and evolution. Evolution is one of the dumbest ideas in the history of humanity, and the devil is laughing at you for believing in that silly theory. And it's, if you don't trust Christ, you're going to go to hell. I'm not your enemy. I'm your friend. I don't want to see you go to hell. I like to see you get converted. But what you're doing is unfair and certainly unwise and I think un-American to require a student to believe a certain religion and all you have is a religious worldview of evolution 
And you require students to believe that before you give them a recommendation letter. Come on, grow up, let kids learn the truth. We can go on and on how people are discriminated against by, because of their belief in creation. Uh, Patrick Henry College was notified they were going to deny their uh, recommendation uh, to be accredited simply because they didn't believe in evolution. We'll have lots of information on our website about how students or universities or teachers are discriminated against because of their belief in creation. Now, it wasn't always this way. If you go back in the past, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, all the scientists believed in creation. Here's a list of quite a few scientists, Francis Bacon, Johann Kepler, uh, Blaise Pascal, Robert Boyle, uh, Isaac Newton. These guys were the founders of major branches of science, Carolus Linnaeus, and they were creationists. George Cuvier, um, on and on the list goes of hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of very famous scientists who were creationists. Not always young earth creationists, but certainly creationists, and many were young earth creationists. Uh, Richard Owen, Louis Agassi, um, James Jewell. All you got to do is notice, folks, the many, nearly all branches of science are started by people who believed in creation not people who believed in evolution. The evolutionists don't come up with anything. They don't create anything. They come in and take over an institution that's already going, and many Christian colleges have been taken over by evolutionists. Harvard, Princeton, Yale started off as Christian schools, and now they've been taken over by those who believe in evolution. The evolutionists don't go start something. They just take over like a leech, you know, or a tick, or a parasite, what somebody else has already created. Uh, Werner von Braun, space scientist, was a strong believer in creation. Um, there are many books out. There's a good book, In Six Days, 50, Why 50 Scientists Chose to Believe in Creation. There are quite a few books on this topic. You can see our website, drdino.com, and get more. Okay, next question. What about separation of church and state? Is it okay to discuss creation in public schools? Well, first place, the phrase separation of church and state is not found in the Constitution. Don't let somebody tell you that the, const the law says it has to be a separation of church and state. That's baloney. That phrase was used by Thomas Jefferson in a letter that he wrote to some pastors in the Danbury Association, a Baptist Association in Connecticut. He's the one that said, the First Amendment has erected a wall of separation between church and state. Thomas Jefferson said that. It's not in the Constitution. And by the way, if there's a wall between the two, it's a one-dimensional wall. It keeps the government out of the church. It, does not, it was not designed to keep the church out of the government. So there's no such thing as separation of church and state found in the Constitution. The fact of the matter is the Founding Fathers, when they gave the First Amendment, Article 1, the same day, I believe, voted to give, I think, seven or ten or fifteen thousand dollars, something, to a mission in uh, St. Louis to help some, a Catholic mission reach the Indians there with what they thought was the gospel. Um, so you just go through the history, go to wallbuilders.com, David Barton's excellent website, and get some of his material, and you can see how that the Founding Fathers were certainly strong believers in creation and had no intention of the government getting involved in the church, but they had every intention of the church getting involved in the government. And the idea of no Christianity in public schools would have been anathema to the Founding Fathers. They would have sent those guys off on a ship to some other country. Okay, next question. How do we see stars that are billions of light years away? I get this question every seminar I do, I believe. There's no question there's an awful lot of stars out there. The Bible says in Nehemiah chapter 9, Thou, even Thou art Lord alone, Thou hast made the heaven and the heaven of heavens. God created all the stars, and there's an awful lot of stars out there. It's interesting, stars blow up every once in a while. They run out of fuel or whatever happens, and they implode and then explode. It's called a nova, or if it's a big one, it's called a supernova. It seems that about every 30 years, a star explodes. Well, after searching the heavens, they've only found 300 supernova rings. So the question would be, if the universe is millions of years old, why aren't there more supernova rings, the remnants of these blown up stars? That indicates only a few thousand years. Of course, the Bible says God made everything 6,000 years ago, and the textbooks say it's billions of years old. I think the textbooks have a problem because there should be a lot more supernova rings. Plus, obviously, you have a problem. Stars being born should equal stars dying or else you're going to have a real serious problem. There are plenty of stars out there, but we've never seen one star forming. We see stars blow up every 25 or 30 years. We've never proven the formation of one new star. One atheist I debated said, oh, Hovind, there's this new star forming right now in Crab Nebula and some of the different uh, clouds out there in space. You see stars forming. Said, no, you don't. You see spots getting brighter. You are assuming a star is forming, but actually all you're seeing is a spot getting brighter. It could be there's a dust cloud clearing and there was already a star behind it. Any fourth grader would know that. So nobody's ever proven the formation of one star. Uh, in Science Magazine in 86, they said the silent embarrassment of modern astrophysics is that we do not know how even a single one of these stars managed to form. 
situation is no better now. There, nobody can prove any star formed in, by natural processes. If dust tries to get together, as it increases in density, it increases the temperature, which increases the m movement, and it drives it back away. It's called Boyle's gas laws. You cannot compress dust into um, solid matter without creating a real serious physical science problem of overcoming the gas laws. The pressure increases, the temperature increases, which drives them out again. It's not going to happen. One professor said, oh, Hovind, we figured if 20 stars explode near each other, they'll produce enough energy to squeeze the gas and make a new star. <laughs> I said, well, sir, that's just brilliant. You know, you're saying if you lose 20, you can gain one. Man, you ought to run for Congress and help those guys borrow their way out of debt. You know, <laughs> that's a dumb idea. We've never seen it happen. It's purely theoretical that 20 stars could do that, but that is a losing proposition, not gaining. There are lots of stars. The Bible says God created the stars in Genesis 1:16. He created them to be lights on the earth. Psalm 147 says he counts the number of the stars and gives names to all of them. The Bible says he layeth the beam of his ch beams of his chambers in the waters, who maketh the clouds his chariot, who walketh upon the wings of the wind. It is possible that Psalm 104 ties in with Psalm 148, that there is still water above the heavens. Nobody knows what's beyond out, you know, the stars, if there's an end at all. But it could be that this verse and uh, verse Revelation where the Lord sits on many waters is talking about the fact that there, is a, there was a layer of water above the earth and there may be another layer of water beyond the stars. Don't know, just a theory, something to chew on. There's no way we can tell anyway. Okay, there's a lot of stars out there. It's been estimated that everybody on earth could own two, two trillion stars to yourself. That's a lot. Million, billion, trillion. The stars are really far away. Hubble telescope focused in on a dot. They thought they found a black spot in space about the size of a grain of sand held at arm's length. They looked at that spot for 10 days, and in that one spot there were so many stars they'd never seen before that they couldn't even count them. That's just one spot the size of a grain of sand, new stars just discovered. There's a lot of stars. Stephen Hawking, who, hate, who hates Christians and creationists, said, and won't debate me, by the way. Steve, I'll take out any time. Uh, he said, stars are so far away, they appear to us to be just pinpoints of light. He said, there's only one feature we can observe, that is the color of their light. So when you look at a star, you cannot see the size or shape of the star. All you see is what color it is. We assume that stars are like the sun, and the sun is like stars, but that is purely an assumption. We don't know that. Some people say, oh, yeah, we can tell by the elements that it's burning. It seems, gives a color characteristic, you know, the signature. You can tell the elements. You know, evolutionists never talk about this, but they are, of course, assuming that even the molecules evolved in other places, just like they evolved on Earth. They're assuming the same 92 elements we have here would be the same found throughout the universe. They've never talked about that, but you have a real serious problem if you just assume that the same molecular arrangement evolved, because molecules would have to evolve too, by your theory, which I think is a dumb idea. Okay. I taught high school trig for many years, is one of the uh, subjects I taught. If you want to find the distance to an object you can't possibly touch, like a star, you have to measure it with what's called parallax trigonometry. You have to know two sides and one angle, or two angles and one side, in order to calculate the distance to this unknown point, or to this, this unknown distance to this point, with simple sine, cosine, tangent. The problem is, Earth is only 8,000 miles in diameter, which is basically nothing compared to star distance. So to, to find the distance to a star, you have to get your observers further apart to make a triangle that's you know, a decent angle. Well, they look at the star in January, then they look at the star in June, and they get a much bigger base on their triangle. This is Earth's orbit around the sun. Well, it's 93 million miles to the sun, which is a long ways, but it takes light eight minutes to get here from the sun. It's called one astronomical unit. That is, uh, the distance from the sun to the Earth is an AU, an astronomical unit. So we are eight light minutes from the sun, which means the diameter of our orbit is 16 light minutes. That would be the diameter of Earth's orbit around the sun. This diagram here shows a little yellow dot on the far left. That would represent Earth's orbit, 16 light minutes. A year has 525,000 minutes in it. That's a real skinny triangle if you did it to scale. It's like having two surveyors with you know, telescopes 16 inches apart looking at a dot 525,000 inches away, which is eight and a third miles. You set that up and draw it out on a piece of graph paper, you find you've got a real skinny triangle. It works out to be an angle of 0 0.017 degrees at the apex. I think you can have a hard time measuring something like that. If you want to measure 100 light years, by the way, that was just to measure one light year. If you wanted to measure 100 light years, you'd have to move your dot 830 miles away, keeping your surveyors 16 inches apart. 
That's like having two guys on my roof here in Pensacola, Florida, looking at a dot in Chicago. If the guys are 16 inches apart and they're focusing on a dot in Chicago, that's a real skinny triangle, okay? Figuring 15 billion light years is clearly impossible. It just can't be done. And I don't think you can tell exactly where you were six months ago on opposite sides of Earth's orbit. That would be a stretch also. Okay, this textbook says, Parallax trigonometry can be used to measure distances less than 100 light years. I agree, much less. I think you'd have a hard time measuring 20 light years, but I'll give them 100, I'll give them 500 for the sake of the argument. The fact is you can't measure a billion. I'm not saying the stars aren't that far away. They, they probably are. I'm just pointing out we have no way of measuring it. We don't know how far away they are. If somebody tells you that star is, you know, 7.9 billion light years away, just say, how did you measure it? Was it a Stanley, a Lefkin, or a Craftsman? Who held the other end of that tape measure? Because I want to meet this guy. It just can't be done. So number one, we cannot measure the distance to the stars. Number two, we don't know what light is. Is it a wave? Is it a photon? Is it a particle? Is, I mean, it behaves sometimes like waves, sometimes like energy. It, it, nobody knows for sure what light is. We know what it does, and we use it all the time, obviously. But nobody's ever defined what light is very clearly. So the entire principle or concept behind a black hole is the idea that light can be attracted by gravity. Well, if light can be attracted by gravity, if black holes exist, which nobody's proven that either, but then the speed of light can't be a constant. At Harvard University in 99, they slowed light down to 38 miles an hour. The next year, they slowed it down to one mile an hour in the year 2000. The next year, they brought it to a dead stop. They took light and absolutely stopped it. This was done at Harvard, it was done at Smithsonian, and it was done at Cambridge. And by the way, that's how science works. An experiment should be demonstrable, repeatable, testable. Evolution is none of those. Nobody's ever demonstrated or tested or proven any of it. It's all in the mind. They think it happened. It's not science. Okay. At Princeton University in the year 2000, they speeded light up to 300 times the speed of light. Why would the speed of light be an unbreakable barrier? Uh, Barry Setterfield, Australian astronomer, did a lot of work on the, the speed of light question. He says, the speed of light has decreased. He said, in the last 300 years, at least 164 measurements of the speed of light have been published, 16 different ways it was measured. He said, the speed of light has apparently decreased so rapidly that experimental error cannot explain it. Here's a chart showing that the speed of light has declined in the last 150 years. About 1960, the chart seems to level off, and everybody since about 1960 has gotten the same number. If you measure the speed of light today, you're probably going to get 186,282 point something miles per second. Okay. That could be because in the late 50s and early 60s, they began using the atomic clock to measure the speed of light. And the atomic clock uses the wavelength of a cesium-133 atom, which means you're using light to measure light. You have a rubber ruler. Of course, you're not going to see it if it's declining. It may be we're on the tail end of a logarithmic, logarithmic digression, or it simply may be we're using a rubber ruler by using this atomic clock to measure it. There's a couple articles showing about how that the speed of light was apparently exceeded by a factor of as much as 100. Clear back in 88 and 95, there were articles published about this. The speed of light is not a constant. Um, the Radio Physical Research Institute in Russia, uh, the cosmologist there, said the speed of light was 10 billion times faster at time zero. Astrophysics and Space Science Magazine, 1987. According to the Big Bang Theory, the speed of light had to be much faster initially. Here's an article from 2001, uh, Science News, saying about the speed of light may have changed over history, study says. Um, Imperial College in London, the man wrote an article and said, a shocking possibility is that the speed of light might change in time during the life of the universe. At uh, Rutgers uh, News Service put on an article from Sydney about a team from Australia that said the speed of light may not be a constant in August of 2002 says the speed of light can change. The speed limit of the cosmos is being questioned. September 2002. So there's a book out called Faster Than the Speed of Light. And I'm sure this fellow who wrote this book will be persecuted for daring to suggest such heresy as this. Discover Magazine uh, ran an article about this. Was Einstein wrong about the speed of light? A recent article saying Einstein was wrong. The speed of light is not a constant. So. I don't think we can prove what light is, and I don't think we can prove lights always travel at the same speed. Number three, the creation was finished when God made it. It's interesting, Jesus made wine out of grapes that never existed. Turned water straight to wine. Where's the grape stage? 
he can make a full-grown man out of the dirt and then make a woman out of his rib and make animals out of the dirt. He can make the earth out of nothing. Jesus made enough to feed 5,000 people out of a little boy sack lunch. We're always trying to limit God. I get real worried about folks that try to put human limitations on God. Uh, God didn't make two babies and put them in the Garden of Eden and hand them a package of seeds and say, here, plant these quick. You're going to need supper. He made a full-grown man and a full-grown woman in a full-grown garden. That's the only way it's going to work. Number four, thing to consider. A light year is a distance. It's not a time. It's a distance. It's the distance light can travel in a year at today's speed. A light year could be done in one second if you speeded the light up. It's simply a distance. It's like so many gazillion miles. I think a six trillion miles is a light year. Okay, number five. Since the speed of light is not proven to be consistent, why would star distance have anything to do with age of the universe? Some people say, oh, wait a minute now. I know we can't measure the distance with uh, tri triangulation, parallax trigonometry. What about measuring with Cepheid variables or redshift? Well, that's the other way they try to do it, and also loaded with flaws in the theory there. The redshift is the idea that when light goes uh, from a star, the red is shifted over. They look at the light through a spectroscope, and you'll see black lines on there, and the black lines are shifted toward the red end of the spectrum. You get the normal spectrum, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. But the black lines are shifted red. And they'll say, wow, this is proof the star is receding. It's, running, it's moving away from us. That could be. I don't know. But there might be other ways to answer this. This is called the Doppler effect. If a train is coming toward you, it squeezes the sound waves in as the train makes noise. And you'll hear it. It drops pitch as it goes past you. It's called the Doppler effect. If you're going past the sound source or the sound source is going past you, either way, it works the same. Sound is it's called compressed coming in and refracted or stretched going out. Well, they thought possibly if the star is coming in, it would squeeze the light waves, whatever light waves are, and make a blue shift. If the star is leaving, it would make a red shift. And so when the red shift was discovered years ago, they looked around the heavens and found most of the stars are giving a red shift. And they said, wow, this proves they're leaving. No, it doesn't, but that was the assumption. And then they said, if all the stars are moving away, that proves there was a Big Bang. That was the evidence for the Big Bang Theory, the red shift. Talk about a lack of logic, but uh, that's what they said. Okay. This fellow says there was an early sign that red shifts reliably indicate the distance of galaxies. For quasars, however, the diagram shows a wide scatter in apparent brightness at every red shift. He said, in fact, there is little correlation of brightness to red shift at all. Either quasars come in an extremely wide range of intrinsic luminosities, as most people believe, or the redshifts do not indicate distance. Sky and Telescope, December 94. Um, same magazine said, uh, thus for the only conclusion that can be drawn is that at least some quasars are relatively nearby, and a large fraction of their redshift is due to something other than expansion of the universe. So if somebody tells you we know the distance to stars because of redshift, say, I'm sorry, that is simply not correct. We don't know the distance because of redshift. Get the book, The Evolution Cruncher, from our ministry. It's $5 for a 900-page book. Excellent book, loaded with stuff on creation evolution. He's got a whole section about the Doppler effect and the expanding universe. The Science News 95 said, Another set of observations indicates that the universe appears to be 8.4 to 10.6 billion years old. The new work relied on the Hubble Space Telescope to obtain, obtain distance to faraway galaxies. A team led by Tanver at the University of England used a two-step method to estimate the Hubble constant. I always get a kick out of that. Here they've got an equation which involves a number that you're going to multiply, like an algebraic equation, and they can change that number. They call it a constant, but they change it all the time. Okay? I taught algebra for years. I'm telling you, you change one letter in an equation or one value in an equation, you change the outcome. That's why they're always getting wild numbers for the age of the universe, because the Hubble constant is not a constant at all. Okay, let's go on here. He said, first they observed a type of standard candle, stars known as Cepheid variables, to find the distance to the spiral galaxy M96. He said, you have to be very careful about drawing conclusions because of the Hubble constant, because measurements have huge systematic errors. Astronomers believed the veil, one of the best studied supernova remnants, was 2,500 years, light years away and 18,000 years old. They were quite wrong. In fact, the veil is only 1,500 light years away and 5,000 years old, from Discover Magazine, January of 2001. An article about Rip Van Winkle showing stars are much younger than they thought. Um, the article, University Around Us at Cambridge University, said even the nearest Cephids are so remote, it's difficult to determine their absolute distance with any accuracy, any great accuracy. 
All large distances in astronomical literature are subject to an error of perhaps 10% from this cause alone. He said, we know that faintness, you know, how bright the star is, arises from two causes, distance and absorbing matter in space, and it's generally not possible to apportion it between the two. Get the book The Evolution Cruncher and find out what happened to Halt and Harp, who dared to question the redshift theory. Good way to lose your job. There's discrimination against those because they're looking for, uh, looking for anything to hang on to this dumb Big Bang theory is the problem. Big Bang theory is a dud. Fred Hoyle said that 30 years ago, or 20 years ago. Okay, Isaiah 40 tells us the Lord sits on the circle of the earth, and it says he stretched out the heavens like a curtain. Isaiah 42 talks about the stretching of the heavens. Isaiah 45 says he stretched out the heavens. Jeremiah 10 says he stretched out the heavens. There's several theories of what's causing the red shift. One theory is the stretching from the creation. This is a normal thing you would expect because he stretched out the heavens like a curtain, just like the Bible told us. Maybe that's the only reason we have a red shift. Second theory is the light's getting tired, traveling great distance. Third theory is, as it travels through whatever space is made up, maybe space is nothing, maybe space is something, we don't know what space is, but as the light travels, that may automatically be a phenomenon that causes the red shift. It could be the Doppler effect, the star could be moving away, I don't know, and nobody knows, okay? It could be the light is being speeded up or slowed down as it goes past a dense gravitational mass in space. We simply don't know what's causing the red shift. Next question, I get to ask this question quite frequently, actually, is the sun shrinking? The sun is obviously burning. You can step outside and look at it in the daytime. The sun is losing about 5 million tons of mass every second. The sun is obviously burning and losing an enormous amount of fuel. So if you go backwards in time and add 5 million tons per second to the sun, you start to create a problem at some point. I don't know what the number is, and I wouldn't give a number because as soon as I give a number and say X number of million years ago this would have happened, the atheist or the skeptic will pick on the number and miss the concept. The fact is the sun is burning. If the sun were larger, it would begin to suck Mercury and Venus in, first of all, Mercury first and then Venus, and then slowly affect Earth. Uh, the Bulletin of American Astronomical Society in uh, 1979 said, Since 1836, more than 100 direct observers, different observers at the Royal Greenwich Observatory and the U.S. Naval Observatory have made direct visual measurements that suggest the sun's diameter is shrinking at the rate of about a tenth of a percent each century which works out to be five feet per hour. Now, whether the number's right, I don't know. But the fact is, it's pretty obvious the sun is burning, and the sun, for a hundred years of measurements, they said it's shrinking about five feet an hour. Of course, now the sun is gigantic, about 880,000 miles in diameter, so it's not a problem. We're not going to lose it anytime soon. Uh, Science Magazine ran an article in 1980 that said several d indirect techniques also confirm the sun is shrinking, although these inferred collapse are only about one-seventh as much. By that thinking, the sun would have been touching the earth uh, 100, 158 million years ago. And again, I don't, that's not my number. Somebody else uh, came up with that as a possible calculation, that the sun would have been touching the earth. The fact is the sun is shrinking. This chart shows the measurements of the, not only the polar diameter, but the equatorial diameter. The sun has uh, north and south pole like the earth does. Both 